Okay. Good morning, everybody. This is uh, our last seminar colloquium from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia. And today we will have the talk by Professor Dr. Xavier Barsons. He will talk about uh, European Southern Observatory supporting leadership in ground based astronomy. And uh, our director, Anchon Alberdi, will introduce uh, Professor Xavier Barsons. Good morning to everybody. We are celebrating today at the IAA here in Granada, what we call the IAA conference. That is a, a, a kind of mini workshop in which we show the activities that the members of the Institute have been developing in both in science and technology during the last year. And we, we, like, we always like to have an invited speaker and today our invited speaker is Xavier Barcons, he's a good friend of the house and then we are very happy to have him with us. Xavier is, as you know, is the ESO Director General since the year 2017, but this is the result of a long career. He did his studies, his bachelor and master degrees in the University of Barcelona. After that, he got his PhD in the University of Cantabria. He went for a postdoc at the UK in the Cambridge University, and then he joined the um, Spanish, uh, the Spanish TSIC, the Spanish Council for Scientific Research, where he is research professor since the year 2002. His uh, activities, his scientific activity has been focused on astronomy at X-ray wavelengths and also until the late 90s in the quasi stellar object absorption lines and the intergalactic medium. He has participated participated and he has led a number of research projects, some of which have provided the backbone for XM and Newton surveys. His interests uh, have unveiled uh, obscure arctic galactic nuclei, nuclei excuse me, in the distant universe, the evolution of the AGM population and the apparent mismatch between the X-ray and optical views of AGM. Uh, much of Bar Barcon's efforts have been directed towards pursuing uh, large projects, beginning, uh, beginning as a co-investigator uh, in the XMM and Newton Survey Science Center, and he has actively pushed, uh, pushed for large X-ray observatory missions, as it was the case of CEUS, ICSO, and the most recent uh, ISAS Athena mission. And before coming ESO Director General, he was also the president of the ESO Council between the years 2012 and 2014. He has dedicated, along his mandate, significant effort to help progress in the major ESO projects, including ALMA, the ELT, and in fact, the ELT was approved during his mandate as ESO Council president. He has more than 250 reference papers in journals and conference proceedings. He has supervised uh, seven PhD students, giving uh, over 100 talks at international conferences and symposium, and chaired and served on the scientific organization committees in, in a large number of international conferences. It's really a, a pleasure to, to welcome Xavier to, for today for our IAA conference day. And, and have, have him as our invited speaker. Today he will be talking about the ESO, supporting European leadership in ground-based astronomy. Uh, thanks, Xavier, and I, and I give you the floor. Well, thank you very much, Anshon. Uh, it's, it's a big pleasure for me to uh, join you today in this <clears throat> celebration of this very difficult year, 2020, uh, uh, but still where we uh, all together have um, achieved quite something um, in very difficult circumstances. So, yes, I would be talking about my thing now, uh, which keeps me busy uh, the whole day and sometimes at night as well, which is so the European <laughs> Southern Observatory. Um, and I have to apologize because uh, I'm sure that a good fraction of you will find some of the slides in the presentation rather boring or redundant or uh, deja vu or something like this, but but I hope that uh, uh, altogether this will still be an, an informative presentation. And of course, I would be very happy to answer any questions you may have at the end. So, <clears throat> well, to start with, what is ESO? Um, so, ESO stands for European Southern Observatory. Follow, um, formally speaking, we are called European Organization for Astronomical Research in the Southern Hemisphere. We are an intergovernmental organization. This means that our convention has been uh, subscribed by the parliaments of the uh, member states. 
that gives us a lot of strength and a lot of support. Um, uh, uh, member states have a commitment to uh, to support us as a providing parliament, and this this, as you will see um, towards the end of my talk, this has been instrumental for uh, ESO to develop its program during the almost 60 years of existence. Um, so this this story began in 1962, in October 1962, um, where this convention was signed by five states to start with, and the mission of the organization is twofold. First, build and operate world-class ground-based astronomical facilities. Um, and second, and very important these days as well, is to uh, foster collaboration and exchange of information in astronomy matters. So we're ultimately an organization that pursues science um, together with the community that we serve. So our final product it's uh, discoveries and science and understanding of the universe. But as I, I will uh, show you towards the end of my talk, um, as a result of a, a study that we have done recently, there's a lot more of societal benefits that our activity uh, brings. And, and this is something that it's very important to, to remember. Uh, we're, of course, not alone in this game, not even in Europe. There's, there's many other ground-based astronomy um, infrastructures that are not part of it, so we all know this. And, and we also have very good cooperation um, with uh, the European Space Agency, actually, in, in, in sometimes coordinating either science or technology development or even communication uh, between ground and space. Um, uh, maybe um, just to underline something that for you it's very obvious, but I, I, I like to, to underline in other audiences, all we do, it's in collaboration with the scientists, with uh, R&D institutes, and industry, uh, so we're not a standalone entity. We are part of an ecosystem. Okay, so today ESO has 16 member states. Um, last one to join was Ireland. You may remember that Spain joined after painful efforts uh, lasting decades um, in uh, 2006, actually effective 2007. Um, in addition to this, uh, in 2018, we started a 10 year partnership program with Australia uh, in one of our programs. Uh, the hope there, and I, I really hope that this will materialize in the next years, is that Australia becomes a full member state of, of ESO like all the others. And I'm actually uh, very optimistic uh, about this once we have run through this pandemic thing that we're going through at the moment. Um, yeah, uh, in 2010, we also signed the accession agreement with Brazil, but this, will, this did not materialize, and in my view, it will never materialize. So this is there uh, floating in, in empty space at the moment, but uh, I, I really don't expect that Brazil will be in a position to join anytime soon. To give you a flavor of our size, uh, there's about 750 employees working at ESO, 450 in Germany, and also 300 in Chile. Our budget uh, this year is about 300 million. Um, that includes, of course, the spending on the ELT, on the building of the extremely large telescope. Um, uh, well, as you know, our headquarters are in, in Garching, uh, in the north of Munich, and the observatories are all in Chile. And we also have an important European policy dimension here, and we're part of IRO Forum, which is a sort of club of scientific intergovernmental organizations, which includes ESA, CERN, and EMBL, and many others. Uh, we do have a friendly relationship with the European Commission um, and specific agreements actually with ESA and, and CERN, especially the one with ESA, I, I treasure a lot and I attach a lot of importance to it. Um, we do have a very special relationship with Chile, as you can imagine. Um, uh, at the uh, top uh, left, you can see, um, yeah, Hubble Space Telescope actually uh, as being um, refurbished from um, uh, from the space shuttle and an image of the Atacama Desert where you can see this famous shunt effect that makes your, your the chimneys in your houses work well. Um, it helps a lot to us. You, you see this this patch of, of land there which is totally uh, free of clouds. This is the Atacama Desert and the, the Andes actually uh, stop most of the clouds at the other side and the, the cold temperature of the of the uh, Pacific Ocean um, helps a lot to keep this place clean. So we have amazing um, uh, sky conditions and therefore this was the choice of the founding fathers of ESO uh, when they decided where to put the telescopes in the South Hemisphere. 
So our agreement with ESO dates uh, just one year after the ESO started. It was updated in, in 1995 after serious political turmoil. And uh, we had uh, signed a number of side agreements. Um, afterwards, the last one we signed was uh, in uh, December 2017 uh, about CTA, about the, the hosting of, of CTA South in our, uh, in our territory. Uh, we have very good institutional relations with the country. Uh, that's, that's very important. Um, and uh, it's also the case that we have seen a lot of development of, of astronomy in Chile during the last decades, which we, we really celebrate and we would like to exploit a little bit more um, while there are opportunities to, 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 to strengthen this, this collaboration, not only in astronomical research, but also in other fields. Um, so yeah, this is a map of our sites. Uh, we do have our headquarters in Munich. For those of you who haven't been there, uh, when travel becomes possible, you should come and visit. Uh, it's, it's a nice place to see. We have a fantastic planetarium and visitor center. I will say a word about it afterwards. And here in Chile, we have um, um, offices in Santiago. Uh, in our grounds, we also host the Santiago Central Office of the Joint Alma Observatory. Um, and then uh, uh, we have these various sites, all, all of them within the, the Atacama Desert, and I will uh, show you some pictures in a minute. So um, our mission, I already explained, this is casting stone in the convention. Um, the vision of the organization has been for 15 years um, to deliver the extremely large telescope, the largest of the class of extremely large telescopes, but um, uh, we don't want to kill the organization while doing this. We want to keep our very powerful observatories uh, in Paranal, the VLT, the VLTI, and also ALMA, of which we are part of, at the forefront of worldwide astronomy. This is, this is our um, vector, this is our direction, this is where we're going to, um, and that's where we will continue going to in the next decade. Um, uh, ESO Council approved last week, no, two weeks ago, um, uh, the strategy for next decade, uh, which uh, um, yeah, is around these this four milestones. Uh, first and most important, implement the operator ELT as the world leading extremely large telescope. Second, equally important to ensure that the facilities that we have today remain competitive at the forefront of astronomical investigations. Third, very important, we need to keep the organization fit for purpose. Um, in, uh, for when we uh, finish the ELT, uh, we should be ready, at least have the capacity and the skill set in the organization to uh, start preparing for, for the next uh, big project, if we have the financial uh, envelope to do it. And last but certainly not this pretend is of leadership role in astronomy. So this, this will be what we will be doing during the next decade. Um, we organize ourselves in terms of what we call programs. Uh, we have one big program which is called La Silla Paranal. This is a program which is uh, in operation. It consists of the, the La Silla site, the VLT and VLTI program in Paranal and also APEX. Uh, this program ends in 2022. Then our second big program also in operation is ALMA, which is itself a partnership with the National Science Foundation and the Natural, um, National Institute for Natural Sciences in Japan. Um, our next program is uh, the ELT, which is in construction, um, as you know, and I will be showing to you. Last one is CTA, uh, which is currently in preparation phase. Uh, we're not going to build it, uh, but we will host it and operate it. Um, so along this, this very high visibility programs, we do have a number of other organizational activities in support of our mission. Uh, we have a relatively modest technology development program. I will be talking about this a little bit. Uh, um, uh, we do have a lot uh, in training um, and research um, for both in science and engineering. We do a lot of work in outreach as, as you're probably aware, uh, and, and this is in support of uh, the community and our, in our member states as well. So I, I will glance through some of these topics during my talk. So as I said, uh, we, um, in, in our program uh, uh, called La Silla Paranal, uh, this is the first uh, piece of it. It's, it's the uh, observatory in La Silla. This is almost 52 years old now. Um, 
it was, uh, yeah, I mean, two years ago, one and a half years ago, we celebrated its 50th anniversary. Um, it has a lot of history behind. Um, there's, there's lots of domes in there. Not many of them are operative. Uh, we actually um, operate as facility instruments, the ESO's 3.6 meter telescope. And uh, this is actually a telescope that it's, it's focusing on, on radial velocity and uh, it, it has harps as its main instrument. There's an equivalent um, um, being developed uh, in the infrared called NIRPS, that it's, um, it, it should be uh, finalized next year. And then the other uh, facility instrument, that we, the facility telescope that we operate is the NTT, the New Technology Telescope. Don't forget that this was the very first telescope in the world that featured active optics. Active optics, the correction of the shape of the primary mirror uh, because of the gravity effects when, when it points. This was developed actually at ESO by an engineer called Ray Wilson that unfortunately passed away two years ago. And uh, now we dedicate this telescope basically to transients, um, to follow up on, on supernovae, on, on gamma ray bursts, on, on gravitational wave events and, and, and the like. Um, on top of this, there's a lot of uh, telescope, uh, hosted telescope projects um, in, the, in the area. We have about maybe 15 of those. Those are largely uh, operated remotely by institutes in the member states, and we provide technical support when it's needed. Um, you have a couple of pictures here. Um, uh, there's, there's one uh, uh, which is called Extras. This is uh, for planet transient observations. And the one with the three towers, this is called Black Gem. This is also a gravitational wave uh, uh, follow-up, um, big imaging uh, um, devices, uh, which is led by, by uh, the Netherlands. And, and uh, I, I believe they are heading now towards first light. Um, last year, we were blessed by a unique event, uh, which was a total solar eclipse on the 2nd of July. Um, uh, to the best of my recollection, it's the third time that an, a total solar eclipse blesses a professional observatory. Uh, previous examples, I believe, were in, in, in Pic de Midi and in Hawaii. Um, so La Silla, it's normally not, of course, not during the pandemic, but in its normal days, we have about 50 people at the site. And that day we had a thousand. So uh, that was a big logistic challenge, lots of safety issues, lots of concerns, lots of work. Um, the day before I was there, the weather didn't look very good, actually. Uh, but um, I mean, on the 2nd of July, everything went perfectly right. I mean, the weather was perfect. The eclipse was just amazing. Um, you know, it, it, it was, I have to say, one of the experiences of, of my life. We, we had visitors from all over the world. Uh, we also were visited by the authorities. You can see picture here with President Piñera and, and uh, ministers and, and other people. So, um, but ultimately, and above all of this, that was a day to celebrate the engagement between astronomy and society. We had lots of people. We have kids from school, elderly people, people who had traveled from the other side of the world, all to celebrate astronomy. That, that was really a very nice event. Okay, so this is Paranal. This is the uh, jewel on the mountaintop, as we like to call it most powerful optical infrared observatory in the world, thanks to these four uh, unit telescopes. Uh, each one of them has a, um, a primary mirror of 8.2 meters, uh, monolithic primary mirror. Um, on top of this, we have another uh, four auxiliary telescopes, 1.8 meters in their primary mirror. And uh, what um, uh, brings an additional uniqueness to the site is of course the interferometer. Um, in the near and the mid infrared, which is a, a gigantic, very powerful infrastructure in 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 uh, these tunnels below uh, below this platform. Uh, we also have uh, still today two survey telescopes: the VST in the optical, two and a half meters in diameter, and Vista, uh, 4.2 meters, 4.1 meter in diameter. Um, that one is in the near infrared, but um, this will change in a couple of years when we will install foremost a multi-object uh, spectrograph. Um, Paranal is operated as an integrated uh, entity. It's, um, uh, it's uh, not that every telescope is operated separately. That, that has uh, brought a lot of synergies. And in the future, 
our intent, and we're putting a lot of effort now into this, is into also integrate the ELT into this uh, single uh, operation hub. Um, some uh, a couple of, of nice nice pictures here of Paranal. This is really a fantastic place. Uh, in the one at the bottom, you can see this is a 360 uh, degree photograph. You can see stars down to the horizon. This is truly amazing. Uh, you can't see this almost anywhere else in the world. But you can also see a threat that we have, right, which is uh, light contamination. You see there uh, a few um, spots uh, in the horizon. One one of them is Antofagasta, the city of Antofagasta. Others are mining compounds. There, there's huge mining exploitations in the surroundings. Uh, some of them hosting 20,000 people, and and we're we're trying to work together with the Chilean government uh, to prevent that light contamination uh, actually um, uh, ends uh, the, um, uh, the 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 uniqueness of the Atacama Desert for astronomical observations. So uh, this uh, needs a lot of attention. Okay, so this is just a collection of pictures. This is one of the eight meter telescopes um, inside its dome. Uh, okay, now I don't move. Oh yes, now I do. Um, uh, some more um, infrastructure equipment. One of the four telescopes, UT4, is equipped with a laser guide star facility uh, where we have uh, four lasers shooting to the sky, they uh, reflect in the sodium layer at 90 kilometers altitude. And we have uh, our wavefront sensing cameras to follow the turbulences of the atmosphere to correct for, for, um, for this effect. Uh, so in, uh, we have an instrument called MUSE, which is the one at the top uh, uh, right when working together with the laser guide star facility. In narrow field mode, we actually achieve the spatial resolution that it's better than that of the Hubble Space Telescope. So this, this is really um, a fantastic uh, thing. And the reliability uh, of this facility, it's now very, very high. So you just, you know, I saw it last night, you know, you press a button and it works. So that's the, there's no, essentially no technical downtime for this anymore. Uh, at uh, the bottom, you can see some of the uh, infrastructure that we have in the delay lines in the tunnels where we, we have to, uh, um, um, yeah, we, we have to combine the light from uh, four telescopes, either the four big ones or the four small ones, to a fraction of a wavelength. So this is a very high precision machine. This, these rails, they have to be, um, every night, uh, they have to be tweaked. Um, the, the position has to be um, uh, um, more accurate than eight microns. So this is, this is a really a very high precision machine, but it works. And the instrument on the top uh, right, it's, uh, it's gravity. Uh, I will talk about it a bit later. Um, this is a beam combiner for, uh, for units as well, and that delivers actually an astromatic uh, precision um, of a few micro arc seconds, uh, which is absolutely amazing. Um, so the way oh, this whole thing works in Paranal, and to some extent La Silla a little bit these days as well, and the ELT would be the same story, is that we at ESO, we build the telescope and all the infrastructure. Of course, we contract industries to do most of the work, but, but we are responsible for the build-up and, and, of course, the maintenance and the operations. The instruments, though, they are developed in partnership with a consortia of institutes, mostly in the member states. And the deal we have there is that we provide the capital costs, we provide money for these, and, of course, the oversight. We have our project managers, our project scientists, project engineers and uh, technical support in mechanical engineering, electronics, software, etc. Uh, but most of the effort is done in the institutes of the member states. We don't pay for that, but we compensate with guaranteed time um, observations. And we have a sort of, of a master agreement for this. And, and it works very well because it takes the best of both, of both worlds. We treasure some and um, yeah, some um, skill sets in ESO that are not easy to find in the community. And uh, in the buildup of these instruments, we also take advantage of, of the effort and the particular skills that the institutes have. So that's, that's been an incredibly productive model and I really don't intend to change it for uh, the years to come. Uh, of course, we end up owning these instruments, we receive them, we accept them, and then we take care of them and we operate them. And we, Make sure that the whole thing, it uh, has very small technical downtime. Uh, we're below 3% uh, 
these days. That, of course, requires some effort, lots of engineering effort and technical um, things, but, um, but it works. So it, uh, we, we're sure that when we point at the sky, uh, we point at the sky and we do science. Um, so um, this instrument develop, uh, development, it's part of something that we call the Parnal Instrumentation Program, and uh, this is the current status. Some of you may be uh, knowledgeable of this, and some of you may be even involved in some of these instruments. Uh, um, Gravity, Espresso and Matisse, they are all in operations now. Those are the last elements of the second generation of the VLT and the VLTI. Um, next steps uh, include an upgrade of CRIRES. This is a high resolution near infrared uh, spectrometer. Um, the instrument is here in Paranal. It was put here, it was installed in the middle of commissioning. I had to send everyone home. So we expect to um, um, resume the commissioning in early 2021 with most of the effort being, being done remotely. Our next piece is uh, IRLOS. This is an upgrade of the Galaxy Infrared Sensor. This is almost done in our premises in, in Garching. We expect to ship it, to ship it to Paranal and to install it uh, maybe during the first half of next year. Um, there's another instrument developed by the community called ARIS. This is led by MBE. Um, um, that we uh, will likely uh, have it installed in 2022. Um, we do have two multi-object spectrographs, one for the VLT, also in 2022, uh, the other one for VISTA, as I mentioned, this is called FORMOS, that in 2023. FORS, that was the very first instrument that the VLT had, um, uh, but there was actually two versions of it. Uh, the first version, it's decommissioned. The second one, it's working. It's one of our work, workhorse instruments. We're planning an upgrade uh, that we uh, were starting now, actually, this year. Um, 2020 and that we expect that it will come back to the observatory in 2023. Since we have two of them, th there will always be one available. Um, we just approved the start of MAVIS. This is a multi-conjugate adaptive optics instrument for the UT4. Uh, this is led by Australia. This is, this is a benefit of having Australians on board with participation of others. Very challenging instrument. We expect to um, have it delivered maybe 2025-2026. In La Silla, there's, there's two instruments developed, one for each one of the facility telescopes, radial velocity instruments and uh, SOX, which is the Son of X shooter. This is a very broad band um, single object spectrometer that, that we expect to receive in 2022. And we are starting phase A studies of uh, a UV spectrograph called CUBES. And we will start next year the phase A study of an upgrade of gravity that was the highest priority of all the proposals that, that the community put together uh, when we started this uh, VLT in the 2030 exercise um, um, in 2019. So this is uh, what Paranal will look like in 2023, hopefully uh, with a few changes, of course, a few decommissioned, decommissioned instruments uh, for the VLTI. We will have, as today, uh, Gravity, Matisse and Pionier, which uh, are our three workhorses. Um, uh, as I say, VISTA will, uh, will um, host um, a multi-object spectrometer um, and the VSD, I really don't know it, uh, the agreement with enough to operate it ends uh, in 2022, so uh, we'll see what happens with that. So, of course, COVID has affected all of this, as you can imagine. In the second half of, Mar of March, we had to send everyone, almost everyone home, actually. We do an orderly shutdown of the observatory. Um, it's uh, very soon, uh, the government of Chile would not allow anyone to travel except for um, essential uh, business or emergency trips. So we could only maintain um, a very small emergency crew in the observatories. This is what we call the safe state. There was, of course, no observations. The telescopes were powered off. The instruments were warmed up, were warmed up but we still had to keep a small crew in all the sites to keep the place in order, uh, the earthquake, uh, fire, uh, etc., all, all these things. So that reduced the number of people that we normally had in Paranal from 150 to 20. Um, in La Silla, we went down to five, and in Apex, we went, we went down to five. Um, so with the improvement of the conditions in Chile, uh, at the end of August, we devised this uh, stepping stone called minimal operations, whereby with uh, 
a very small set of additional people, we could actually do some observations. And, and that, that was a very good idea, actually. We, we could bring only a few more people at the start within all safe, safety requirements and start doing some observations. The first observation in the VLT after this long shutdown was on the 13th of September. Um, I have to admit it was a very emotional day for, for me and for many other people. Uh, for Apex, it was uh, very soon after, I, I think it was the 18th. La Silla had to wait another couple of weeks, but they also restarted <clears throat> relatively soon. So um, this was what we call minimal operations. It's uh, a few telescopes with a few instruments um, only. Now, um, with uh, the sustained condition in the pandemic in Chile, we could aim at a little bit more, which is what we call restricted operations, which is essentially where we are almost right now. That means that we do science observations with all the telescopes and almost all the observing modes, not all of them, but almost. There are some that require quite a lot of engineering interventions that, that we cannot do. Um, now, uh, the team in Barnal is about 60 people, uh, actually today it's 67. Uh, we are planning in January to allow up to 80. Uh, that's probably the maximum that we can have, uh, given the pandemic restrictions. And in La Silla, we can also increase a little bit. So, um, yes, we're now almost operating everything. I believe the only thing that we're missing is the, the LTI with the unit telescopes here in Paranal. Um, and I think that Shooter is also falling behind a little bit, but this, this will be fixed in, in two or three weeks. So this is, this is very good news. We are doing science observations with all the telescopes. Um, of course, not much room for any technical interventions, only really emergency and critical maintenance interventions um, to to do a little bit more, we're coming up with a plan now for the first quarter of next year, but with very restricted uh, travel to, to the sites, very small amount of people. So we're trying to keep the place very, very safe because um, if we have an infection here at the site, the authorities will shut it down and then, then it does, that will not be nice. So here's a few pictures on how this whole thing uh, went. Uh, uh, that uh, you can see the last uh, emergency team leaving the site um, the first trial that after six and a half months, UT2 could still move uh, along the, the, the azimuth uh, bearing. Um, uh, on the bottom left, you can see the first time that uh, one of the domes opened after six and a half months on the 13th of uh, September. And uh, on the bottom right, you can also see the very first time that Apex pointed back at the sky. I think it was on the 18th of September. Uh, 20, sorry, 20 of September. So um, we rely a lot on remote support. We do have our people in uh, Chile and in Garching connected almost all the time here, um, uh, helping our um, uh, very restricted amount of engineers and people at the site. And, and this is, um, yeah, this is, this is working, I wouldn't say nicely, but it is yeah, it is helping us a lot, uh, having the, the support, the remote support from, from everyone. Uh, sorry, I just couldn't resist to show this one. Uh, I'm in Paranal. I'm very happy to be here, actually, after so many months of being unable to come to Chile. And we're, we're having um, a fantastic set of nights now, uh, as, as we usually do. Uh, because, um, of course, this is pre-pandemic time, but, um, I mean, this shows essentially the breakdown of what we have here. I mean, weather downtime is normally below 10%, actually much below 10%. So 90% of the nights are available um, uh, for, for uh, observations. We do have to invest a little bit in engineering time. So when we have science time, uh, we are sure that we're not going to face technical issues and that gives a very high throughput of the observatory. Okay, so uh, let me move quickly to ALMA. Uh, that, of course, many of you are very familiar with ALMA, uh, more than me, I would say. Um, ALMA is a, a very large submillimeter radio interferometer in the Chagnantor Plateau at 5,000 meters. Um, the reason to go there, you know it, it's um, because of the low uh, water vapor um, column. Um, it's really very, very small. Um, we often um, reach below a millimeter. Um, and uh, this, this makes uh, the submillimeter part of the, 
of, of the spectrum available uh, from that side. ALMA is a partnership between uh, three uh, parties and it's operated together by uh, ESO, uh, NRIO and NAOJ. Um, uh, the operation uh, has a part here in Chile, which we call the JEO, the Joint ALMA Observatory. Uh, they have an office in Santiago and uh, all the sites, um, uh, all the site uh, infrastructure. Uh, and there's also uh, what I would call the back-end operations, which are run from the Northern Hemisphere in the three, uh, in the three executive sites. So in, in Barking, in, in Charlottesville and in Mitaka. Um, um, the array consists of 66 uh, antennas in the Charnantor Plateau, which is 16 kilometers across in diameter. Uh, the back end and the correlator are also up there. We're thinking now about uh, the upgraded or the new correlator that we will have to build in the next decade or so. Maybe it should not be placed at the high site, but at the operation support facility, which is at 3,000 meters near San Pedro de Atacama, and that, I don't know, we're, we're studying this. So this is another picture of these antennas. They can be moved by these transporters. And uh, there at the far end, we also have Apex, which is, I have been talking about, the, this is um, a sublimated dish uh, that we operate on behalf of a partnership with the Onsala Space Observatory and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in, in Bonn. Um, okay, ESO has a share of 37.5% of the time. Uh, we get much more proposals, a lot of pressure. So the oversubscription on the ESO side is the highest amongst all the partnerships. So our oversubscription is about six. In the North American uh, side, it's about uh, four, if I believe, or three. And in, in Japan, it's about two um, and, and same in Chile. So yeah, we have a very engaged ALMA community, but also a very frustrated ALMA community. I'm afraid, and there's not very much we can do about it. So yeah, this is just some pictures of the infrastructure, the correlator, um, uh, the uh, science operations facility, which is actually going to um, uh, move down to Santiago in the next couple of years, and, and the hotel where our personnel are posted. Um, yeah, so in March, uh, Alma uh, also had to shut down. Actually, they decided, the Alma director decided to fully power off the observatory. Um, this was probably the right thing to do at the moment, but of course now it's making um, a little bit more difficult to uh, revamp and to restart any type of operation. Uh, there's a plan called Return to Operations that was approved and developed during the months. Uh, this started on the 1st of October by preparing the OSF. During this time, there was no one there. There were a small crew, a small emergency team, uh, sleeping in San Pedro and visiting the site every day. Uh, so the operation support facility uh, started to ramp up uh, during October. By the end of the month, everyone could be lodged in there. There's damages and repairs during to the weather and other things. Um, now, last week, uh, they started to work at the uh, high sites uh, on the technical building uh, powering on the critical systems, in particular the correlator, that's, that's very important. I haven't yet heard whether that was successful or not. And then um, something like next week, they will start um, inspecting the antennas and trying to power them up. Uh, we expect trouble there. We expect that some of them will have to be repaired. But still, uh, we are confident that, that a sufficient number of them will be OK. So in January, we uh, expect to start uh, to verify the uh, array function. For this, we need maybe 15 antennas and the correlator, of course, and to do uh, some basic science with 25 antennas. Still, between January, with, within January, then in February, it's the monthly, um, the yearly shutdown because of the altiplanic winter. And depending on, of course, on the evolution of the pandemic here in Chile, we may be doing sort of regular science observations with ALMA in March. Um, in, in at ESO, at our support center in Garching, we're, we have been supporting all of this. We have been catching up with uh, long uh, backlogs that we had on many projects. And in the meantime, we've also made quite significant project, uh, progress on two new projects that we have. One is the development of a new band two um, receivers, um, and then the development of a new observing tool that was totally outdated. Uh, here again, some pictures of the ALMA staff working on the power station, on the antenna, and 
uh, yeah, relaxing in the casino. Okay, the ELT. So this is my what keeps me awake at night, as you can imagine. Um, so I could be talking for hours on this, and I realize I have spent almost all my time. So thank you very much. I'll try to squeeze this in five minutes. Um, uh, the uh, okay, yeah, the ELT will be the largest optical infrared telescope in the world. The primary mirror um, is 39.3 meters. It's a segmented mirror uh, with hexagons. Uh, of the same size than those of the uh, Grand Tecan, essentially one and a half meters. The difference is that the GTC contains 36 of these segments and the ELT will contain 798. Um, so uh, the collecting area is amazing. And uh, when working in the fraction limits, uh, the resolution will also be amazing. Um, uh, all science objectives of the, of the ELT are really uh, transformational, uh, going from exoplanet science to um, stellar populations, uh, cosmology, um, everything will be impacted by the ELT. Construction started in 2015 um, and uh, we're now proceeding um, uh, towards uh, what we call technical first light. This doesn't mean first science time. Um, technical first light was projected into November 2025. We know that COVID will have an impact of this. Unfortunately, we're not able to quantify it yet. Um, total cost 1.3 billion euros. Um, I'm very glad that our council and our member states uh, agreed uh, on the 1st of December to provide us an additional amount of money that we were requesting to complete the construction of the ELT and to prepare the observatory, the Paranal Observatory, to host and operate the ELT, which is also a very challenging project in itself. And despite the bad times and the pandemic and everything, the member states were supportive of this and they put another 120 million on the table uh, for us, which, you know, I'm really, really um, thankful for that. So the ELT is being erected in Cerro Amazonas. This is only uh, a 40 minutes driving from here, from, uh, from Paranal, from the base camp. So we don't need to build a separate observatory there. So this is a picture um, yeah, of how it is now. Um, we, uh, the um, contractor uh, of the civil work was working in there until end of July. Then they had a serious cluster of COVID infections. They had to stop. Uh, they are now talking about restarting work in, in January. And this is, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work in, in there already, right? I mean, all the foundations and uh, the dumpers for the earthquake um, um, are, are uh, ready to go there. Uh, the chiller plant is also uh, being worked on and, and the uh, lean concrete for the telescope structure is also there. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is 110 meters across uh, and in the outer uh, ring, uh, this is the auxiliary building. The dome will sit in this in this ring that you can see uh, in the middle and and then at the center that's where the telescope will sit this is 55 meters across so it's a gigantic beast it's an amazing um, um yeah piece of engineering um at the bottom right you can see the elt technical facility this is actually here in paranal this is where the mirror coating uh, plants uh, are going to be installed and uh, most of the technical operations for the ELT will be done here in, in Paranal. Um, just a few pictures on, on uh, items, on hardware that it's actually being manufactured in Europe. This is going really very well. We had some impact from COVID, maybe, yeah, we've lost, you know, a few months, two or three, but, but the factories are still working. Um, uh, well, I don't know, you can see several elements, for example, the boogies that will move the dome. There's 36 of those that's on the top uh, left. Um, each one weighs 27 tons. There's actually already something like 12 of those uh, in Armazones waiting uh, for the construction to continue. Um, uh, the, uh, of course, the optomechanics is very challenging in this telescope with the five mirrors. Um, uh, there's this all types of things like position actuators, edge sensors. Uh, you can see also a very important piece here, which is the M4 reference body. This is a silicon carbide uh, structure that supports uh, the M4, the M4 is the adaptive mirror, uh, so it has lots of actuators um, and uh, in the back uh, to um, 
yeah, to conduct the adaptive optics. Um, so here's the uh, mineral production, the glass production at, at Schott in Germany and the polishing at, at Riosk in Poitiers in France of the M1 segments of the M2, the secondary mirror that will be flying 60 meters in the air. Um, it's a four meter uh, mirror, quite scary. Uh, the M3, which is a sort of periscope mirror and the M4 mirror shells, uh, which have to be extremely thin, something like two millimeters because of the adaptive optics correction. So uh, here's some more. Um, I'm, I'm very glad to see, for example, at the top left, uh, this, is, this is one of the six petals that the M4 uh, will have it's equipped already with all the all all the actuators and everything. So this is real hardware that will go into the telescope. So that's 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 becoming real. That has left uh, has left the paper world, and it's it's now becoming real stuff that we will see in the telescope someday. Um, yeah, uh, this is uh, ESO. Uh, this is our integration hall where we're doing a lot of testing of these position actuators, the control loops. Uh, we have a test bench uh, that you can see on the top right that can accommodate seven segments. This is 1% of the total number of segments that the ELT will have, but we can test and iterate on the control loops, for example, um, in, in this facility. So, um, yeah, and CTA. CTA, as I said, it's not something that we're going to build, but we are were, were going to host the CTA South array and operate it. Uh, we are actually a partner of, of, of CTA, of the CTA um, um, company today. We will be a funding partner of the CTA ERIC. Um, and uh, in the budget for next year uh, of CTA, there's already um, um, a budget line to start working on the infrastructure. The CTA will be placed in the valley in between Paranal and Amazonas in uh, our ESO territory and uh, there's a need to start with an access road, of course, and this, I believe, it can start in 2021. So that will be the very first steps. I mentioned before technology development. Um, this is something that we do independent of our instrument development. So we try to um, push forward technologies that we believe are going to be necessary or interesting for our activities um, and, and uh, yeah, and and this, there's a number of them. Those are ongoing projects. Some of them are about to be closed now. And, and we have a long queue of others waiting. That's, 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 that's true. But just wanted to give you a flavor of what type of technology development we work on. Um, just to not be too overexcited, we cannot invest much money into this these days, but, um, but still it is a sizable effort. So the first project, Fiat, this is something that we developed in-house. It's a test facility for science infrared arrays. And, and this is almost now finished. And actually, ESA has requested that we procure a spare for them because they also, they're also interested in that type of test facilities. This is, this is a big cryostat with all the equipment and, and so on. Uh, we're also moving on uh, with the uh, development of cryo amplifiers for advanced ALMA receivers. Um, laser uh, guide star, this is um, something that we're very strong on in at, at ESO, uh, these lasers that we're using now for adaptive optics and actually that everyone uses around the world, those were uh, patented by, by ESO a long time ago. And uh, there's this companies now that they, that they that fabricate them. In particular, there's one in Germany called Toptica that they, they've got the license. So uh, the next horizon here is to develop pulsed lasers, which will be a lot more helpful to, to try to follow up much more accurately the turbulences of the atmospheres. There's lots of tests in here. Some of them are actually done at the Canary Islands. Um, and, and, and this is also very, very advanced. Uh, we've started a project about uh, advanced reflective coatings for our mirrors. Uh, we're losing the, um, the blue and the UV uh, by optimizing the near infrared. And, and there's, there's probably alternatives to this. Um, we're also working on a large infrared uh, zero noise uh, um, detector called Safira. We have a small format of this. This is actually in, for example, used by gravity, um, but, but we're heading towards the uh, 500 by 500 pixel array. New generation controller, uh, the formable mirrors. We signed an agreement earlier this year with ESA to develop jointly curved CCD detectors, some of our future instruments. Uh, require those and and this is something that ESA 
also requires mostly for Earth observation uh, programs. And um, the last bullet, it's the most challenging one. Uh, this is the development of an instrument for the ELT called PCS uh, that will ultimately be able to image an exo-Earth orbiting an, an exo-Sun if it is not too far from, uh, from us. So this, this is a very challenging beast. It will take a long time. I don't think we're going to see this before 2035, but there's a lot of R&D to be done there in, in extreme adaptive optics, um, for example. Um, we pay a lot of attention to the archive um, uh, and to make it uh, friendly and helpful. One step that we have already taken is to merge both the uh, La Silla Paranal and Arma Ar Alma archives, our archive science facility portal. You click your coordinates and, and you can retrieve both the, the VLT and the Alma data if there is uh, anything. And that, of course, pays off because um, uh, this is the number of papers that ESO enables per year. We're at about a thousand now, and more than 30% of those use archival data. Actually, we're now up at 35%. And out of those, maybe half of them do not use any PI data. So it's purely archival. So this is the second life for the data. And that, of course, enhances the productivity of our facilities, which is very good. Okay, so um, I have now a long thing here, which I will skip because this is about things that you all know about big science um, achievements during the last uh, years. Uh, Proxima B was, was one of them uh, that was led by Guillaume Anglada Scudé when he was in, in Northern Ireland. Um, this is a still a very interesting target, actually. I mean, we're, we're, we're keeping an eye here. We have uh, conducted an experiment last year with an instrument called Vizier that was equipped with an adaptive optics module called NIR. And uh, there was um, not very much of an evidence of, uh, of uh, planets, not in this one, but in Alpha Sen, actually, in Alpha Centaurus. But uh, a reanalysis of the data has shown that there is, there's a hint of it. So if we can at all, we may actually come back to that, to that source and uh, we may actually get an image of, uh, of a planet around, um, orbiting around uh, Alpha Sen. Um, TRAPPIST-1, you all heard about this. It's a multiple um, planetary system around that very bright star, TRAPPIST-1, that was discovered um, by a robotic uh, telescope in La Silla and confirmed with a number of instruments, including Spitzer. And, and on the, on the right-hand side, you, you have uh, all this sequence of um, of transits um, that you could see with, with Hawkeye. Uh, and uh, you can see actually for three planets uh, transiting simultaneously in front of the stars. So that's, that, that was really very nice. Of course, I, we're very proud that uh, Michel Mayor and Didier Queloz got the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, in 2019, formally not for anything that they had done uh, with ESO because ESO was carefully avoided in the wording of the Nobel Prize. But, I mean, you can see both of these gentlemen standing in front of the 3.6 meter telescope in La Silla where they actually developed HARPS, which has been a regular velocity finder of, of uh, new planets and with which more than 150 uh, exoplanets have been discovered. So uh, we were very, very happy with, with, with the award of this Nobel Prize. And um, again, you know, thanks to instruments like SPHERE and others, uh, we have been able to obtain uh, the first image of an exoplanet, of course, very far from the star. Even the first image of two exoplanets orbiting around the same star. This is from, from this year. Um, that's all very nice. Um, also, the VLTI and its unique facilities. This is a giant star uh, where you can actually see this, this uh, cells, these convection cells um, in the surface uh, using Pionier. Um, so stars are no longer point-like uh, uh, when you look with the VLTI and, and of course this, uh, this confirms what we knew, right? That, that these this big stars have convective envelopes. Um, yeah, we all know this. You also know this. You have had Andrea Ges giving a talk at IAA that was um, very, very nice. Um, of course, um, Andrea was strongly supported by Keck. Uh, in the same way that ESO supported uh, Reinhard Gensel's group uh, for more than 30 years. And, and this is, you know, the latest results on it, both obtained with, with gravity. First, the gravitational redshift uh, of uh, star S2 that, was, uh, that could be measured in 2018. 
after the peri Bothron and then the precession of the orbit that could actually be measured um, after two years, well, accumulating data after two years. This is using gravity and um, NACO and Symphony, all instruments that have been developed for this purpose. And there's a lot of contributions that DSO has done to this. So we, I believe we can feel legitimately proud of this Nobel Prize as well. Um, yeah, a lot of other breakthroughs like uh, this survey of proto protoplanetary disks. Uh, this was the dream uh, when ALMA was built. If you look at the construction proposal of ALMA, you will see simulations that look very much like this. Um, and of course, those rings is, we believe, where planets are, are, are being formed. So this, this is now really beautiful confirmation of our ideas. And of course, you know all about this, right? About the, uh, about the first image of a black hole of M87 um, done by the uh, Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, um, of course, when the presentation was made at the, in Brussels at the European Commission, the European Commission, uh, uh, the European Commissioners uh, forget that uh, yes, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope was funded by uh, the ERC and so on, but the, the infrastructure that the Event Horizon Telescope used was funded and contained a lot of work, but by, by um, many other stakeholders. And we again, you know, feel legitimately proud of ESO, that uh, two of the seven uh, radio telescopes that were used, uh, we, we are an integral part of. One was ALMA, the other one was APEX. And if you remove these two telescopes, you see no evidence of uh, um, a black hole shadow. But this, is, this was the most fascinating result, of course, of the year, by far. I can't resist putting this other one that came up recently with ALMA. Um, so this is a, a disk galaxy at Redshift 4.2. This is Actually, what you see, you see this ring uh, um, uh, amplified uh, by, by a foreground galaxy at Redshift 0.26. Um, and uh, you can actually reconstruct and you can measure the rotation of the galaxy and uh, the velocity dispersion. And actually, the rotation is much higher than the velocity dispersion. So this galaxy is actually rotation supported. It's not a merger. And you can see a Milky Way at Redshift 4.2 with ALMA. This is really beautiful result as well. Um, you may be interested in this program that we're uh, launching at ESO. We had launched to facilitate uh, young people, young astronomers to publicize their work. Um, um, and uh, we, we made a call to the community. We had 334 applications of people who want to present their work in a 20 minute talk. Of course, we will be invited inviting institute directors and other potential employees, but unfortunately we will have to down select very severely down to 24. So we'll, we hope that we can announce this, but I think this is also part of our role in the community, trying to put bits and pieces of the community in, in contact. Okay, so this is the supernova I mentioned before, whenever travel becomes possible, please do come and see us at, at the ESO Supernova Planetarium and Visitor Center. This was a donation by um, a foundation in Germany, well, uh, by a philanthropist, Klaus Chira. Um, uh, and yeah, we, we, in normal times, we, we, we receive um, something like 80,000 visitors a year. And, and it's really very, very nice. Um, we've put some effort, you may be interested into this, uh, to formulate our benefits to society, not only science, uh, we have actually developed a brochure with this that we will um, make available in January together with the communication campaign. And um, so we have analyzed this and we provide a lot of benefits. It's not, it's not only science. It's, we have built it around those uh, five pillars, science and engineering. We have come up with engineering solutions that have been exported even to industry, nothing to do with astronomy. Um, you know, there's this over a thousand papers every year um, there's the many astronomers, the big community uh, that, that uses those facilities. Um, uh, in economy, of course, I mean, we're building things, we're giving profit to industries, we're training industries. Uh, they then can do business uh, for other partners. We have plenty of examples of this. Um, talent development, uh, we have trained a number of, an amazing number of students and fellows during the last 10 years, both in Garcin and, and Chile. And, uh, we also have internship uh, programs for scientists, for engineers, even for science writers and, 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 and uh, science journalists. So all of this creates an, an environment uh, that uh, we are very happy to support of, of talent development. 
in education and, and outreach, uh, yes, I mean, the, there's, there's a number here which says that during the last decade, ESO has been featured um, something like 46 times per day uh, on average. Of course, this is dominated by a few peaks, but uh, it is still quite a lot of presence. And I'm also very proud that there's essentially no contemporary book in astronomy that doesn't contain an ESO image. So that's that's very good, and uh, yeah, I mean, we also like to play this role of um, policy making in, in not only in Europe but but worldwide, which I think it is an important asset for the community. Okay, so I'm almost done. Uh, this is uh, the secret: it's that we have the commitment of the member states uh, uh, through the uh, convention. We can plan years in advance. We know to high precision what our budget is going to be in 10 years from now so we can we can do some accurate planning this is good that cannot be done by a single uh, country um, they all work together very well um, the spirit of cooperation across the member states it's it's very very high there's there's no fights in there there's there's actually only cooperation um, the second bullet i wanted to underline this is paraphrasing something that i heard jim peebles to say many times related to cosmological models, which is what you get is what you put in a cosmological model. And ESO works very much in the same way. Uh, member states get uh, as much advantage as they want to invest. If they invest in their scientific community, they will get a lot of benefit. If they invest in instrument development, they will get a lot of benefit. If they, if they train their industry, they will get a lot of benefit. If they do nothing of those, then they will not get any benefit and they will just pay the fees. So that's not very attractive. And, and I think everyone understands now. Um, and, and for this, of course, we, we, we need to cultivate these this links with all the, the sectors of the community. So uh, I think this is all. I don't think I have anything else to add here. OK, thank you very much. Sorry for exhausting my entire hour, um, as I'm afraid I always do. Thank you very much, Xavier, for this uh, excellent talk. And now we will open the, the talk for, for questions. If uh, you don't know how to raise your hand, please activate the participant button here in the menu button in the menu. And you will open a window here with all participants. At the end, you will have the button for raise your hand. And the questions will be managed by Isabella. Excuse me, I was just raising my hand instead of putting my <laughs> microphone on. I just question being at the end of the year, probably. So um, first of all, um, Xavier, I'd like to thank you um, for, for this extremely interesting talk that you've done, as always, I, I, I would say. Um, and um, just to add to our director's word uh, at the beginning, so um, Refer, referring to the connection of the uh, uh, of this talk with the uh, with the uh, final session of our uh, I mean the journée or jornadas, so uh, of the IAA at the end of the year, it, 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 they are also mixed together with the several uh, us It's going to be otherwise, in the sense of this is also a web a web uh, locum, so in the several us program at the IAA. So I'm um, so that's another reason to 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 be grateful to Xavier for accepting our double in invitation. And um, um, I really take the opportunity to con congratulate uh, in all the ESO work in, in, the, in the person of uh, Xavier Barcons, Professor Barcons, because we, I, I think that we all share the opinion that we are all proud of what ESO is doing, which is really amazing and putting us in, in the front for all in the front where I mean in the forefront of everything in, in, in astronomy and and so I have just a, a question that I take the opportunity to start with with a could be short or long I mean I, I I hope you will make it short in the sense of what you have just said in what you put is what you get so from the point of view of the Spanish community what's your opinion opinion about that like what 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 you what we are getting in in terms of what we are putting so um uh, okay, I, I cannot have opinions, right? Um, ah. <laughs> I, I can, I can, I can tell you facts. Um, so uh, there's there's a number of aspects in which Spain is doing 
very, very, very well. Um, and um, I mean, just well, maybe uh, this is not terribly relevant, but I, I, I want to tell you that uh, Spanish uh, personnel are incredibly talented, and uh, we, I believe, we have almost 40 Spanish employees at this. So this is this is more than the percentage that we contribute. So that means that there's a lot of talent when we do recruitments. Um, and, uh, and and so on. There's, there's there's a lot of experience in the Spanish community, and and therefore um, I mean this this has been growing continuously, right? So there's a tradition, and 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 there's very good grounds in there. Um, in terms of scientific exploitation, I would say that that Spain is doing extremely well with Alma. Um, there's there's a there's a very powerful, very well trained community in in Alma, very engaged. And, and this is this is paying off um, very well. Um, we Spain or not we? Sorry, Spain is not putting enough proposals for the VLT and the VLTI. This sorry, I have to say this. This there's not enough pressure. The success rate of the proposals that Spain um, puts on these telescopes is average or maybe slightly better than average, but there's not enough of them. And I can only assign this to the fact that Spain has access to other facilities where maybe um, competition is not so fierce, right? And, and therefore, it's slightly easier to get observing time. Um, and of course, everyone has a limited bandwidth, right? So this is, this, this is clear. So um, maybe uh, there's room for the Spanish community to grow um, because we, you haven't reached the ceiling of what you can achieve out of ESO. And of course, last but not least, the, um, well, not last actually, there's another point I want to make. Um, Spanish companies, Spanish industries, uh, there's, there's a, a set which are doing extremely well in the bids for our industrial contracts. And, and we, um, I mean, in the ELT that has provided multiple opportunities and uh, uh, there's, there's been a number of contracts that, that you know, I have signed with Spanish companies in the last three years. I mean, just to give you a few examples, um, Elon uh, is now providing the two um, prefocal stations of the ELT. The prefocal station, it's a sort of, of, of an instrument, right? I mean, it's the interface between the telescope and, and the instruments. The prefocal station will, will be the one with which we get first light, right? And it's a complex machine, um, and and uh, yeah, and Idom is developing it. I mean, we granted them a contract for one. Now we grant the contract for the second one as well. Um, uh, other big contracts we have with with Senair on on the on on the um, structure for the M2 and M3 and M5, and we have a myriad of other contracts in you know, of the order of one two million euros with. A number of other companies. So this 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 very very good uh, uh, a very good substrate. So if you measure the industrial return coefficient of Spain, it's it's actually well within the expectation. And of course, it could have been more if things have been done in a different way. Um, but last but not least, the instrumentation front, right? I mean, I, I showed you what the deal is here. I mean, we we it's not like ISA, right? I mean, in the ISA science program, um, uh, the consortia that provide the institutes have to pay, uh, and then the national agencies have to subsidize every single euro that it's spending there. Our deal is slightly better. We pay part of it. Um, we, we pay one part, uh, which is typically, I don't know, between a third and a half, uh, especially uh, the hardware costs. And then the other part is provided by the consortia. And this is the part that it's rewarded in granting time observing. I would like to see more Spanish involvement in this. I have to be honest. I, I, there's, there's, um, there's, there's a lot of, um, of uh, work to do. Uh, the ELT instruments are extremely complex, um, extreme, extremely costly. Uh, we will continue developing instruments for the VLT in, in the years to come at a sort of regular sustained base, um, not like the explosion that represented the second generation um, in the VLT or, or the VLTI, but, but we will continue um, um, doing this. So find your niche, find your place in parameter space when you can make unique contributions and where uh, the colleagues in other uh, institutes 
want to have you or want to partner with you uh, uh, to, to build this instrument. Uh, they are amazing machines. Um, they are very costly. They require a lot of effort. We're talking 10 year adventures in there, right? Uh, building an instrument uh, end to end from when you have a concept to when you, you end the commissioning. So um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's my other advice that I, I would give. But I mean, you don't tell, you don't need to tell me how it works in Spain. I know, <laughs> I know that funding instrumentation is a nightmare. I, in my previous role as advisor of the science ministry, I tried to work hard to have a separate uh, tool for this purpose that, you know, you could have a sort of placeholder for 10 years um, and so on. And uh, it, it never works. And I've, I've just given up. So. Um, Sorry, that was much longer than I wanted. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you very much. And I'd just, just to add some, a, a, a little piece of contribution for the second generation for the ELT, we are, at the IAA, we are contributing to Mosaic mm -hmm. and Harry. So that, but, but that journey, we are right, we have to improve that. Okay, so yeah. I have in the list of people asking at Jose Carlos del Toro. Okay. I, I, I just would give him my applause. But uh, I, I take the the opportunity the opportunity to to really congratulate personally uh, Xavier for a great talk. Uh, it's been really overwhelming uh, uh, from from the point of view of a sort of physicist uh, looking at uh, such a huge facility, and the, well, the largest uh, facility worldwide is is really really impressive. And I, when when you were talking about the pandemic, I was remembering our efforts to commission a solar orbiter during the pandemic. A solar orbiter, you know, has been the, the first mission ever uh, uh, remotely controlled from home. <laughs> yes, from home. And uh, uh, I I guess I guess the the. the kind of infrastructure and, and the proceedings you have for uh, managing managing the uh, the observatory are not like those of ESA but uh, is there is there any any plans for those interactions uh, from uh, from home office in uh, 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 with the with the observatory Okay, so uh, yes, thank you very much, Jose Carlos. Um, um, maybe this is um, a, a two bullet answer. Um, first, um, we do have something called uh, designated visible modes uh, for observations in our observatories. That does not mean that you do remote observing from home, but that means that you have all the all, all, you can see the same screens as the uh, as the telescope and instrument operator and and the support astronomer can see and you you talk to them as if you were there so we, we're using this now every day essentially for all all the visitor observations so you can you can join the observing team here in Paranal in real time from your phone um, uh, we, we do not have properly a remote observing set up um, and we may think about this in the future possibly to do part of the science operation uh, from uh, somewhere else maybe from from santiago or or this this is something that we will have to think about but this is this is in the realm of observations right um in in technical activities uh, we do have a facility called uh, giraffe um which is actually uh a telescope console control from Garshin. So we can do this. We and and this we are these days we're using every night um, for uh, because we're still warming up and putting instruments back into line. So we need the support from the engineers, and and we have a room which is you know protected and uh, yeah uh, where you can actually control the telescope from from Garshin. Uh, and and this uh, you know that we had been using occasionally during the years now we're using every night uh, and for the um, commissioning of instruments we will keep using those as well uh, most of the teams will stay in, in Garshing and only 
you know, one or two people maybe will have to travel to Chile to the observatory, and and most of the work will be done using this this model. So we're we're yeah, I mean we're, we're we had to use this. We had to use this. Um, I, I I believe the tendency will have to be in all the observatories in the world because of the environment uh, and because of the um, yeah uh, wildlife. Uh, um, um, balance uh, considerations in the future it will have to be that we restrict the number of people that actually have to be on the site to operate telescopes there, there will always be a, a number of people that have to be here right but as i showed before uh, today if we were in full swing paranal we'll have 150 people right plus um plus maybe another 30 if we have an instrument being installed, right? This is more or less the limit of our capacity. Now think about what will happen when we have the ELT, right? You know, we may have to double this. 300 people in the middle of the desert in a place that doesn't have water, that we have to track. We have to track the water every day, right? We have power now, which is good. And we have, a, a, we're going to, well, not we, but the company is going to build a photovoltaic uh, plant here so that's all very friendly but still you know that this is probably a fraction of these people that do not really need to be here and that uh, they can support from an office in in santiago so this this we will uh, we will have to develop and and we have actually um even put a name to this we will we call it the integrated operations program in in, in Paranal, um, also making use of artificial intelligence, uh, predictive maintenance, uh, condition-based based maintenance, all, all these tools that, that uh, you know, we, we cannot simply keep operating the VLT as we did 20 years ago, right? So this, this needs to, to evolve. Uh, I want to mention here that last week I had a meeting with, um, with Brad Smith and um, he's the Microsoft president there. They're very um, proud of engaging with us in a proof of concept project um, uh, at the moment. And uh, one of them, which is very interesting, um, is to predict the uh, seeing and the turbulence atmosphere for the next hours. Uh, so we have, they, they have used the artificial intelligence techniques, accumulating all the data from the last 20 plus years that we have operating the site, right? And, and it works. It works, um, so we can now schedule our observations. You know, a few hours in advance, understanding or you know what is the weather going to be like in there. So this is, you know, this can boost the efficiency uh, in our science delivery by a huge factor. So yes, I mean all all these things are in the boat, in, in the melting pot at the moment. And sorry again that I gave an answer which is far too long. <laughs> okay, <beautiful. laughs> Great. Okay, so that now there's Matilde. So, hi, uh, can you hear me? Good. Yes, I can hear you. Ah, okay. So, thanks a lot, Xavier, for the great talk. I, I, uh, I would like to know which are the instruments that are expected to be first light, so at first light, um, at the ELT? Yeah. So, formally speaking, we have two first light instruments. Uh, one is Harmony, which is an, an IFU. Um, um, which is also going down to the optical, and the other one is Mikado. This is a high-res uh, camera and, and spectrograph. Um, seeing the evolution of the uh, development of the two instruments, I, I we believe that what we will have as a first light instrument will be Mikado uh, with uh, with SCAO with single conjugate adaptive optics. Only that has limited uh, performance. Um, essentially, you, you have a relatively limited sky coverage uh, to use Mikado, but this is likely to be the instrument that will make it uh, as a first science instrument uh, after, after the ELT. Yeah. And then next, uh, we still don't know when Harmony will be able to come. Uh, afterwards, we, it will come Maori. This is not properly an instrument. This is an, an adaptive, opti, uh, adaptive optics feed for Mikado, which will then, you know, empower Mikado to do a, a lot more science. 
and uh, and then the next instrument still part of the first generation but not first light it was never meant to be first light will be metis this is a mid infrared um, multi-purpose uh, instrument that has imaging um, um, spectroscopic uh, spectroscopy i believe even, even polar imaging mm -hmm. so those are the approved instruments so far um, then there's the next generation of instruments which are high res and mosaic that Isabel was mentioning before, those are not yet approved. Um, uh, the phase A was completed some time ago. Uh, the consortia are doing pre-phase V activities uh, without our support because we simply can't provide that support. Um, now, uh, my intention is to submit to Council uh, for approval the start of at least one of these two instruments next year. But, uh, I mean, the real start will probably be in, in 2022 with the full uh, swing and, and so on. So that's that's more or less the, the sequence that, that we contemplate at the moment. And as I mentioned before, PCS, this is something that requires a lot of R&D in between. And, and, you know, I really don't see this happening before 20, 2035. But, um, but yeah, I mean, this is a challenge for all the big ELTs. Eh? And, and, and for us, uh, we will have the advantage that the ultimate um, uh, physical limits that the ELT will have, they scale like diameter to the eighth power. So it's, you know, uh, we, we will be much, much better than the competitors there. Uh, so that's, that, that's, that's a hope at least. Okay, and Charlie, and Remy has a question. Hello. Xavier, a very nice talk. Thanks a lot. A very Thank short you. question referring to interferometry. Uh, yes. uh, really, I mean, with uh, I think with gravity, the number of fields that can be studied with interferometry have really increased a lot. Uh, AGNs, many others. Also mm -hmm. with Matisse, I think it will be the case. Have you already noted, and with gravity plus, you can imagine with increasing sensitivity, etc. Have you already noticed the increase in the pressure in the uh, VLTI oh, yes. proposals? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. That 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 began, I think, three semesters ago. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, the VLTI was, you know, barely oversubscribed for a number of semesters. Yeah. But uh, since since we were able to offer gravity and later Matisse, we, we are, I can't quote a number now, but, but the oversubscription of the VLTI has gone up very, very visibly, you know, maybe, um, you know, at least doubled or, or even tripled with respect nice. to what it was to be. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I can imagine that because really, I mean, th this is a superb, superb, uh, uh, yeah. you know, service that uh, that ISO can provide. Really, I mean, it's it's not comparable to any other facility. Oh. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, maybe a comment to add here. We're working um, also together with the community on a network of VLTI centers of expertise. Mm -hmm. You you may have heard of this, and actually, there's some funding that um well there's, there's a project that has been well that has been a very difficult project to put together which is the merger between radionet and opticon mm -hmm. um, because there's very big egos in there pilot i pilot yeah uh, i had to mediate myself at some point uh, uh not very successfully um but we have been granted this right and and this this has um um some budget to support not only the ARC uh, network, the Alma Regional Center network, but also the VLTI Center of Expertise mm -hmm. network, which I, I think it's, it's an important development because it will help the community to engage with the VLTI, which was deemed to be a very, um, you know, um, a, well, an instrument for, for black belts, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this, this is of course, is changing now. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Xavier. Yep. And happy Christmas, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> and, and there's also a question by Josefa Masegosa. Pepa, please. Hello, Javier. Hola, Pepa. I could not resist to say something to you. <laughs> and I was waiting if many people like to approach. I am more, I am supporting very much uh, the Anchon point of view of uh, gravity because uh, recently I have been looking at some wonderful data in the AGM research yeah. uh, with gravity. So I am yeah. very, very happy. Um, I I I want to to ask you most uh, well 
first congratulations to you and all the ISO people. Thank you. To run this very, very complicated, I cannot imagine the, this uh, the amount of complication. Running this infrastructure uh, is, is, is incredible. And the great success you get. Uh, we follow the ISO uh, news and, and it's really impressive. Um, but uh, I'd like uh, to ask you a sociological question. Okay. And this is how can we motivate the young generation if they cannot attend observations and look to the telescope and travel to Chile? Because I think that part of my career have been traveling with the ISO project to La Silla and coming back. I used to, to do it for some while. Uh, twice a year, so I learned a lot about uh, many things and about telescopes and about how to run this. And so I, I now I am, I am. This is maybe is a question of an old person like me with a, a, a large career. That uh, that uh, how can I motivate the the youngest uh, generation? Because this is one of the most fascinating things mm. about uh, our, our, our career, our, our activities, uh, that astronomy allows you to travel to from one observatory to another and this thing. Mm. So that I would like to know your opinion on that. Okay, thank you, Pepa. Yeah, you, th this, this is a very valid question, of course. And uh, well, for the time being, I have to say that we are not planning to switch off visitor modes mm -hmm. in, in Paranal. And of course, we're not planning because we cannot to switch off visitor mode in La Silla. I mean, what we have now is an emergency patch. Uh, but, uh, but well, I, mean, I have to also to be honest, I mean, the demand we have on visitor mode has decreased over the years. Um, you know, it went from more than 50% to now 20%. But we would like to keep it at that level. I mean, for, it is beneficial for the community, is beneficial for the young people to get to see how, um, how the observatory operates. But it's also very helpful for us, for, for the people that actually run the observatory. I mean, they enjoy a lot seeing the colleagues coming here for the observations when that makes makes sense. So for the time being, we are not planning to change that. Of course, the pandemic does not allow us to bring anyone on site at the moment. Uh, but when this is over, the intent is very much to go, to go back to the previous paradigm. So that, that, that I believe, um, a, a fraction of the observations being done in visitor mode is something that I, I see advantages in, in all respects. Having said all that, you have a lot of colleagues in there who use space observatories, Peppa, yourself, right? Okay, <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> and, and you really don't want to travel there, right? I would uh, like to. I, I agree that, that, yeah, that, that seeing this, is, is, it, it, it changes your, your perception, right? I mean, it, it is. I mean, even for me, you know, I've been in Paranal many times and, you know, at many other observatories, observing many times, but, you know, I'm, I was full of excitement when I was able to come back for the first time in a year, right? And, and you know, being in the control room and, and seeing how things are done, this, this, is, this is enormously uh, motivation, you know, even, even for a professional. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's an incredible experience. And I can imagine if yeah. you are at Paranal with the VLT, it's mm. really, really, very great. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Papa. Have good uh, health and, and happy Christmas. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's no more, no more questions. Just I just like to take the opportunity to to wish you all, and in particular Xavier, uh, a happy new and different year uh, to <laughs> 2021. And um, and thank you very much for for this uh, this colloquium. Um, I, you know, uh, I extended the invitation to for you to be in here in person when possible. It was in principle the, uh, I mean, the plan was that, but it couldn't be. But but I, I hope it will be. 
So uh, thank you very much, Xavier. Thank and you. Thanks very much. A pleasure to see you all. At least we could try to celebrate as we, as far as we can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye.